This podcast is part of the No Phony Podcast Network, the home of independent awesomeness. you guys to be the next journey you know and we're like we're not we're not journey and i started getting my own life back together the way i wanted it fuck yeah i'm ready for this casey what do you know about hair metal? I don't know much, Bill. I have a feeling we're going to learn a little bit today. We might learn a little bit about hair metal. You really, you never listened to it growing up? I know you're, you're a little younger than I am. What were you listening yeah. to when you were like 14, 15, 16? <clears throat> when I was 14, 15, or 16, I wasn't listening to anything. I was more focused on uh, football and weightlifting and professional wrestling on television. Right. I actually believe I might have had an album of all wrestlers' entrance music. Yeah, you and I did not grow up the same way. <laughs> so 14, 15, and 16, for me, living in, you know, I guess it was 88, 89, 90, that area. Uh, I remember it was, it was the high school time for me. So there's a, there was a scene happening. There was a, is it a scene? I guess it's a, it's a scene, I guess. It's hair metal. So hair metal was this sort of brief period, kind of like disco. It came, it made a giant splash. It was everywhere. You couldn't get the fuck away from it. And then it went away really fast. So we're going to talk today to uh, Joey Allen. Joey Allen is a guitarist with the band Warrant. Do you know Warrant? Of course I've heard of Warrant. Name one Warrant song. Cherry Pie. Yeah, that's what everybody knows, but there's another huge one. That would be he heaven. heaven, heaven, you know, heaven, sure. Of course. Uh, these songs, man, these were like the biggest songs uh, of the day. And at, at that age, I'm like, what do I want to do with my life? I want to be a guitar player. I want to be a rock star. So like these guys, like their posters were all over my wall. So I would wake up every morning. The first thing I would do is wake up and I would see Joey Allen's face. TMI, I sleep on the right side of my face and it was just exactly where the posters were. There were probably about five Warren posters. So I like got re like intimately familiar with these guys' tattoos and you know, the kind of guitars that they played. And that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a rock star. And I would sit there and I would learn Warren songs and transcribe the solos. And you know, it wasn't just them. It was Poison, Motley Crue I had on the wall, Aerosmith, Def Leppard, Skid Row. And then I remember I had this other wall. It was like, I couldn't devote this whole wall to just one band. So it was like a Tesla picture and a Faster Pussycat picture and an LA Guns picture. It was like, that was the others. <laughs> and in between, there were, you know, girls in bikinis and all that stuff. So that okay, yeah, that's through my head. That's what I was going to get. At. I was like, I was thinking my, I remember my uh, teenage years being a bit different as I had, like, I remember a picture of, uh, what was her name? Heather Thomas from, uh, was she from Dukes of Hazard, right? No, was Heather Thomas from the uh, Fall Guy? Fall oh, Guy. yeah, yeah, from Fall Guy, yeah, yeah. With the short Daisy Dukes song. Yep. I, that was like, that was my room. I remember that poster. I'm sure I remember that poster. I'm sure there were several, but there's one Heather Thomas poster that everybody had. Yeah, man, that was a, it was a good time to be alive. It was just fun rock and roll music. There was no... <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing else to it but let's just party have fun and just live and that was a it was a great great time to be alive man yeah you're a few years older than i am right you're yeah, i'm, uh, I'm 45 <laughs> you know <laughs> all right so you're about six years older than i am so yeah you got a few years on me and it really did come and go that fast so i talked to a lot of people it's like were you into hair metal or were you after hair metal and you know those who were just slightly after really don't know a whole lot about the scene because it just moved so quick. It was tough too, because I remember what happened is you had fans that would hear the new stuff coming out because in 1991, it was like Pearl Jam started to come around and Nirvana and Alice in Chains and Soundgarden. So this grunge movement started to come up and the grunge sound was almost like the antithesis of everything hair metal. 
right? No guitar solos, no hairspray. Everything was, you know, long hair, you know, greased down or, you know, dirty, grungy, grunged down, whatever. You know, there was no leather, slick, tight pants. It was all, you know, jeans and flannels. So a lot of fans of music really left hair metal pretty fast and jumped onto, I don't want to call it bandwagon, but let's use that word, jumped onto that bandwagon and left hair metal behind. So all of these bands all of a sudden went from being the biggest people on the planet to almost obscure. And it happened like within a year. It's very strange. So Warren was one of those bands that were at the peak of their, uh, of their, uh, of their scene. And then all of a sudden music changed. Some bands survived, you know, you still hear about Bon Jovi, you know, people still go to see Motley Crue, but a lot of bands just died in -hmm. terms of, you know, their, their recognition as songwriters. So Warrant still plays today, but it's really like another iteration of what it used to be. And it's a little bit more of a nostalgia, am I saying that nostalgia kind of act? Mm-hmm. So they don't write anymore. But the times that they were writing in the 80s, I really think they had solid songs, really good songs. Cherry Pie is a super fun song, right? But then you can listen to some of their, some of their ballads, right? This was the, the era of power ballads. Oh, Every yeah. album had to have two power ballads. <laughs> Like it was a rule. It was an unwritten rule that every hair metal band had to have two soft love songs. And then every other song is about like sex and drugs and rock and roll. It was a fun time, man. So I'm really excited to talk to Joey and hopefully, you know, we can get some more dirt, you know, behind the scenes kind of stuff. Yeah, this, uh, this will be interesting. Cause I, like I said, I don't know too much about, uh, this was before my time. So I'm going to try not to gush. i've met my share of famous people but uh you know when you you studied this guy's work as a 14 year old yeah it's gonna come back to me a little bit i might shed a tear i'll try not to cry (laughs) we'll see all right well i guess that's it we'll have joey up in in just a moment you can cry if you want to man (sighs) cry tears of salty joy (laughs) <laughs> finally meeting a hero i've actually so the the singer of the band all right i'll tell you this story I, i'm not sure i'm going to tell this story to joey but the singer of the band his name was janie lane right so janie lane we all know now had a pretty bad alcohol problem maybe some other drugs i can't remember but he ended up leaving the band you know the band had to continue with another singer I bumped into janie lane while he had left the band he was actually in a rut he was in a pretty bad spot in his life didn't know this when I met him. So I'm actually at a, uh, a grocery store, right? My ex-wife and I are at a grocery store in Akron, Ohio. I don't live in Akron. I live in Pennsylvania here with you. But I was out visiting, uh, what was I there for? God, why do people go to Akron? I don't know what I was there for. I was there for something. I had a hotel and I was hungry. So we went to the supermarket. It was like 11.30 p.m. Standing in line at this grocery store. And the line must have been 50 people long. They only had one aisle open. And I'm standing there with my, my ex-wife and I turn around. I told you, I know what these guys' tattoos look like. Like, I know these guys. And I just look down and I see this arm and I see the tattoo. And I, I, I look up and I'm like, oh, my God, it's Janie Lane from Warren. Right? This is the grunge time, right? So Janie's been a little bit out of the picture for a while. And uh, I say to my ex-wife, I go, that's Janie Lane right behind us. I'm whispering. She looks at me and she goes, Ugh, oh, that, that ain't him because he looked, he looked pretty bad. Right? I think he was on a bender. I think he was like pretty hungover. He looked really rough. I said, I'm sure that's him. So I turn around. I say, hey. He goes, hey. I say, are, are you Janie Lane from Warrant? Looks at me with like disgust. He's like, yeah. And I go, oh, my God. I'm, I'm your biggest fan. My ex-wife hears that, this conversation going on. Turns around and goes, oh, my God. Like she's like, it's really you. And like every person in line turns around to look. Right now, So now all eyes are on this guy. And I'm just like, I don't know what to say. Like, it's embarrassing. I met you in a line in the supermarket. I don't know what to say. So I just like, hey, man, loved your music, grew up with your stuff. You know, I, I hope all is good. And I just kind of turned around and faced forward and kind of like all nervous. Like, I just met the guy I, I grew up idolizing. And uh, a couple of seconds go by and he goes, man, you think they'd open up another fucking lane? Yeah. Yeah, Janie, you would think they'd open up another lane. And right then and there, I'm like, rock stars have the same problem as us simple people. As us regular citizens. So I got a, a, a grumpy version of JD, but you know, I did get to meet somebody from Warren before. So this will be the second person from Warren that I'll have uh, ever met. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it, man. I know you're very into it. So I can tell you too that Janie Lane likes Oreos because that's what he was holding. That's what he was buying. Just a bag of Oreos. That's it. Just a bag of Oreos. 
He was standing wow. in a line of 50 people at a giant eagle in Akron, Ohio, with a bag of Oreos. Breaking news. I would have been pissed, too, <laughs> if I had to wait. Just want my goddamn Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's going to be calling in any second. We should do some plugs and All right. interview. Yeah, if you like this uh, episode, check our website out, deluxeedition.show. We're on Instagram at deluxeeditionpod. That's only with one E. Uh, our website is with two E's, Deluxe Edition. Uh, Sam is on uh, Twitter and Instagram. You just wanted to make it hard for everybody, didn't you, with the one E, two E thing? <laughs> <laughs> if they won't allow... I'm at the limit of letters on, they won't allow me to add that extra E as our handle. <laughs> so anyway, both of our handles on Instagram and Twitter are Deluxe Edition Pod, only one E. Website, deluxeedition.show. Facebook, Deluxe Edition, yet another pop culture podcast. Oh uh, am I missing anything, Bill? I don't know. We, we, you, you have set up so many social media accounts, I, I can't keep track. I just found out we had a deluxe edition group, a Facebook group last night. Yes. Yeah, yeah. there's a bunch of people in there. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go say something funny and see what happens. And I posted something and nobody responded. It was like, it was like a fart in church. Like, it did not go well. <laughs> well, we got to add a little more people. Yeah, so join our groups. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share with your friends. And... Uh, I also just found out we're not on. Uh, I got to work on this for our listener, Kyle. Uh, we got to get on Castbox for Kyle. I don't even know what that is. So I apologize, Kyle, that we're not on Castbox, but we'll we'll get there. We'll do this for you. It's all for you, Kyle. You, I've never heard of Castbox before, but we need that listener. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else, Bill? I think that's it. I'm really looking right. forward to this. Well, yeah, Joey is here and in the waiting room, so uh, let's let him in and I'll let you do your thing. Joey, yeah. look at you. You look great. Look at this shit. Yeah, that's different. Your Joey hair's Gibbons. shorter, but your beard is longer. Joey Gibbons, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for uh, taking the time to, to chat with us. Right um, on. Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a long-time, long-time fan, so like a real fan, you know? Like, I know you're... Your, your style of playing and all your songs. So this is a real honor for me. Thank I'd you, love man. To, love to kick off with you, um, learn a little bit about, you know, some of the ways that you guys wrote songs. So Warren, you know, you guys had so many songs that were, to this day, like I go back and I listen to some of them. I saw Red. I think like that's a song that just is such a super song. It could still hang out today and could chart today in my mind. You guys have so many songs that are real, really standout tunes. I've heard Janie, for the people listening, Janie is the uh, former lead singer of Warren. I've heard Janie say that, you know, he writes the songs and, you know, Heaven, for example, is a song I remember him saying that he wrote when he was a teenager. But I'm from band, uh, playing in bands too. I've played in bands as well and have written songs. And I've always been curious, how do you guys work on songs? Because I have to think your contribution um, is just as important as everybody else's as a guitar player. Well, I mean, it depends on what version of warrant you're talking about because it's it's um you know the first three records obviously that i was with you know when janie was you know and the original uh band was together and janie was the main songwriter he just had a knack for writing killer tunes and his words and his wordsmithing was just killer i mean if you look at songs like uncle tom's cabin or in the sticks or you're the only hell your mom ever raised and, stuff like that rainmaker you know so he just had a he had a knack for it and he would bring a tune in usually he'd come in and pick up one of our guitars you know that were already plugged into whatever gear we were playing at the time during pre-production and he would say hey check this out and and we'd sit down and and, and just work on it as a band you know and, and it, a band's like to me even if there's a main songwriter in a band um, or two or three for that matter, because the, the later warrant, like the last three records, you know, I, I got a song on one, Jerry writes a lot, Eric writes a lot, Robert writes a lot. We all put in ideas. It just matters what comes out at the end, you know? Um, but in those first three records, it was really lame. 
for the most Interesting. Part. Yeah, I mean, you just, you know, it, it, you listen to the song, and you're like, oh, that's great. Yeah, of course, you know. You don't, it's not, it doesn't really matter where it comes from, you know. But that was the process. I mean, he would, he, for those first three records, he would come in with the song pretty much dialed in, and we would just, you'd put your, you'd put your own seasoning to it. It, it to me, a band's like a, like, you know, if it's a five-piece band, you got five different fingertips, you know? And then when you make a fist, you know, you can you can have a product that means a lot and it, and it sounds different like this than it does like this. You know what I mean? So having Stevens play the way he plays drums open-handed and the way he sings and the way I play guitar, the way, the way Eric and I play together and how it's recorded and how it's mixed, it all makes the warrant pie, so to speak. <laughs> I would figure because I've seen Janie strum guitar. I've never heard him like solo. I've never heard him, you know, play some of the the licks that you know make up some of these tunes. So when you come in and you hear something he writes, they're probably it probably doesn't have those you know those hooks yet. Because to me, those riffs are incredibly valuable to the entire song. So do you say, okay, that's a great structure, great lyrics, great hook. I'm going to flavor it with you know the this iconic riff that now stays in everybody's head forever. He comes in with the riff the way he plays it, and he, you know, he doesn't palm mute. He doesn't. He's he, he wasn't he wasn't a, a lead guitar player, but he was a, a decent a decent guitar player. And he would come in with the riff, and then he'd show it to me, and I'd play it, and he'd go, "Yeah, that's it. That's great." So, I mean, it. Like I said again, it's just it's the way you translate it, and everybody everybody plays different. You know, you could pick up a. Ten thousand dollar guitar or a hundred dollar guitar, you're still going to sound like yourself, no matter what you plug it into. I mean, there's a lot more to the way guitar players sound than their gear. Obviously, about I think about eighty percent of it comes from the right and the left hand and how your brain works. You know, so yeah, absolutely. You, there's definitely that portion of it, but you can't take away from where it comes from. And if the guy's got the riff. Just because he doesn't play it muted, you know, like, you know, or or dive into something or play it like that. Just that one riff in the cherry pie, you know. I mean, Eric plays that different than I do. Um, and I always tell him, dude, that's that's not the way you play it. Because in the mix, it's my riff, you know. I mean, Janie wrote it, but I'm playing it. And I play it real palm muted and I open a few times and, but when we play it together, it sounds right. It's just bizarre. So, um, you know, you just go figure, you know. I've had trouble in my past work with other guitar players because it's almost like, you know, uh, I want to get the spotlight. No, I want to get the spotlight and do the solos. And, uh, you know, it's been, you know, sort of that, that's kind of been my history. But you two, you and Eric, you both take leads. You both sort of have the same role, it would seem. Maybe I'm wrong. But I just always thought that was fascinating because there weren't many bands doing that. There weren't many two guitar player bands where both players were soloing because solos are a very big deal in the 80s. Uh, what's the best way to put it? I mean, I, I probably play 60, 40. You know, I'll do like 60% of solos. He's 40 live um, on record. Sometimes it's different. And Dog Eat Dog, for instance, I think most of those solos were all me. He played some some singers and things like that but it just depends on on where you're at as a guitar player who works harder you know in pre-production some guys don't work as hard as others i i'm the kind of guy that sits down with you know an old school metronome and my and all my books and my scales and i open them up and i sit there as boring as it is and i just practice you know and get my chops up and um i don't know if eric's necessarily got that same work ethic i know he works a lot and practices a lot but we never really sat down together and do that pre-production like that a lot. It's much more separated, believe it or not. That's interesting. And then you just kind of plug in together and it just works. You just found a good. Yeah. Record. It's like the last record we, we, we uh, did with Jeff Pilson, who's a bass player from Foreigner. He's been in Dawkins. He's a great producer, great songwriter, great singer, great friend, great crazy guy. Um, when we did that record, the only one that was in the studio when I played, uh, for the most part, it was Robert, myself, and Pilsen when I did all my tracks. And there, there were songs on that last record, Louder, Harder, Faster, that I typically, I didn't want to do the solos because I didn't really, to be honest with you, like the 
the mode of the song. It was this. It was there was a lot of uh, there are a few songs on that last record that are a little happy, so to speak. And I like the heavier stuff that's a little with a little more attitude. So there are three songs in there where I said, "Hey, Eric, take these." You know, I don't, I can't do anything with them. And um, so there's all kinds of different decisions made when you're making a record. That's it. So you like the darker stuff. So I know Doggy Dog seemed when it came out. You know, the, the the party band thing, I was still hanging on to that. And, you know, we all know that music flavors changed. And I'm sure you've been asked about that a million times. Grunge sort of rolls in. Do you change in time? Just like, I think I want to get a little heavier. Or did you so sort of start being influenced by maybe some of the Alice in Chains sort of grungier, banging on the E and drop D a little bit more? Or, you know, how, how, does your, how did your music sort of change as you have been in Warrant? You know, my tastes have always been the same. I mean, I grew up on, oh, when I was, what, 12, I think? No, 11, you know, was when I started ripping my sister's records. I got two older sisters, so I'd rip off their records. They had like, you know, you've got, I'm like, sorry, my phone's going nuts. You've got stuff like uh, Machine Head by Deep Purple. And then I'd find her Kiss Alive record. And, and then as I got into my own stuff, um, I got into Priest and Maiden and, Def Leppard, and I was a big Cheap Trick fan, you know, so there you got like a, a more of a pop rock band, and then you got Maiden, you know, so it just, it, it just depends on what flavors you as a guitar player, and what you, and what your, I think, roots are, you know what I mean, I mean, and, and you, and you take that, you take that anywhere, it's, it doesn't matter, it, it's not like, it's not like I don't like a, a good hit song, no matter what, you know, it could be a country song, it could be a, anybody playing it could be a reggae song if it's catchy it's catchy you know but to me the way i i play guitar and what i really like to do is i, I love the heavier stuff i also seem to recall uh correct me if i'm wrong so when i would go see a lot of live bands i saw you guys play with um motley croup the kickstart okay. by heart tour yep so i saw you there and you know i was studying guitar so i was studying your playing I was studying a lot of people's playing and, and i would go see the shows and the solos would be pretty much like the record Yours weren't. So I seem to recall that you, you know, maybe had improvised a lot of the stuff on the record. Is that true? Or do you write out your solos to make sure that they're spot on when the, they get recorded? The first two records were comp solos. So it's just like you go in and you just play and play and play and play. And then they'd be like, okay, see ya. And you'd come back and, and you know, we call them Edward Scissorhands. Because in the old day when you used actual two-inch tape, they would go in and they would just take it and they would splice shit together left and right. And you'd literally have to relearn what you did because you'd, there'd be a solo there and you're like, wow, okay. And sometimes it would jump from like first position all the way up to neck to where it was like physically impossible to get there in time. You'd have to, you'd just have to rethink about what you're going to do live. So it could have been some of that or, you know, when you play the same solo time and time and time and time again, Sometimes it gets boring, to be honest with you, and you want to deviate a little bit off and maybe hold a note out longer, or, you know, you might be in a different mood. It just depends. It depends on the night, really. Nowadays, we try to play it as much like the record as possible because, really, that's what people want to hear. So we work hard on making it pretty much that, with, with the exception of the beginning or the ending of the song. And even down to the vocals, I mean, we're setting in, you know, in the uh, dressing room before we go on and tuning up our vocals and making sure we got our stuff together. So it's, it's a little different now than it was back in our 20s where we were drinking and having a little more fun <laughs> than we do now. Did Columbia give you guys a lot of freedom? Were you able to do whatever you wanted to do or were they always kind of stepping in and saying, this is our investment, we want to make sure that this makes money? It's not really, I guess it's an investment in one, it's more of a really bad loan is what it is. Um, back then was you get a record deal for three or four records and there'd be an advance for each record that you could use to, you know, that advance would be used to make the record. And then they'd pay you back, you pay them back on, on record sales. But it was always like, this is horrible deals that if you're in, if you read it as a businessman today, what I know today I knew that then it would have been a different negotiation just because it's a horrible payback. I own 10, 20 cents on the dollar. So every time those guys make a buck, you're paying them back 20 cents on 250 grand you borrowed to make, make a record. 
you know? Yeah. I think dog eat dog got up to a half a million when we made that record. And then videos, videos are all recoupable and God knows those cost money. You know, I think we did I don't know, 10, 20 videos back in the day. So it's just Columbia didn't look at it necessarily. I'm sure they looked at it as their investment, but by the time they make the deal and you're in, they know your catalog. They know what songs you've demoed probably 20, 30 songs per record. And, and you pick, you know, 10, 11, 12 to record and you go in and, and that's when you get with your producer and, and try to make a record that everybody's proud of. And at the end you deliver it and everybody's got an opinion, you know, from the guy that signed you to the president of the label. And sometimes in the beginning, the first record, there was, there was a lot of freedom. Once it got successful, then all the opinions started coming in from Columbia and specifically the president. The Donnie Einer is a good dude, but you know, when you have somebody like that coming in and saying, Hey man, I want you guys to be the next journey, you know, and we're like, we're not, we're not journey, you know, we're, we're not anywhere near journey. We don't have that level of songwriting, you know, Jonathan Kane and Neil Sean wrote some beautiful songs, all those guys, amazing, you know, even that level of playing, you know, like Steve Smith and guys, a master on the drums and Neil and, and just all those guys, it's a different band that we want to be our band, you know, but you always got that comparison or, or Donnie Einer saying something like, Hey man, they just had, they just had re-signed like Aerosmith. I guess Aerosmith was, were they on the Epic maybe in the beginning? Oh, then I, they don't went, I don't know where they went, but they came back to Columbia and when they did, we were still there and love in an elevator was out. Cherry pie. That record was baked. And, uh, Donnie Einer, listened to it and he said, no, we need one big hit. And that's when Janie, he goes, we need a love in an elevator. And Lane, like, I guess in 20 minutes, one night at four or five in the morning, pin to cherry pie. I was, I was off. I was at a golf tournament somewhere in Colorado. I had to run back and record that rec that song for that record. It changed everything. So yes, to answer your question, yes, there was some freedom. They don't come down to the studio and they don't hover over you and, watch you record, but they're certainly concerned because they have to sell it. I mean, they have a bank of, of radio guys that work. Everybody thinks, oh, it's just the band. The band does it. The band does everything, and it's the band's magic. They're just great, but uh, there's a huge bank of people that are responsible for the success of any band that you never hear about. I don't know what it's like now as much, but back in the day, there were radio promotion guys, there were marketing guys, there were art guys, there were the guy that signed you, there were, you know, I mean, it's just a massive, massive team of people it takes to get that ball rolling. And if you get some success to keep it rolling and keep everybody's head in the game. So, so yes to no, there's freedom and then there's not, you know, yeah, yeah it makes depends sense. on what, what portion of the business you're looking at. Right. I can't imagine they give you a giant advance and they say, Hey, you know, you guys are young guys and you're going to go party like rock stars. And that responsibility must've been kind of crazy. Like I mean, you're basically running your own business independently. They give you that advance and you have to fund where it all goes. But you're saying, I think you're saying there's a team still that you're probably paying for with your advance. That's connecting you with the label. Well, Is that a fair record label that just gets paid? They get paid by the right. I mean, at that point, Sony owns, they still do, Sony owns Columbia. Sony's, Sony's a small company, right? So it's, it, there's a lot of people that actually work for the record company that have day gigs, and that's what they do. They don't work, they might, we might be one on, you know, one of their projects, but we're, they don't work directly for us. The only people that actually work directly for us are your management team, your, your accountants, your lawyers, things like that. And, and hopefully if you have a good manager, they'll help you manage stuff like that, which is keep it together. And then, you know, and then a producer is responsible as well to manage the budget. If you've got 250 grand to make a record, you're not going to spend 200 of it partying. You know, you've got a studio fees back in the day. You, you know, you want to put a harmonica on the record and nobody in the band plays harmonica. You got to bring a harmonica player in you, that shit all costs money. So it's managed just like a business, you know. Unfortunately, the band guys at that point, the first three records, we weren't really concerned that much about any of that. Yeah. It would be nice in hindsight, too, because we would have saved a lot of money. <laughs> That's interesting. 
do you think looking back at things so now you're older i'm not actually sure how old you are i'm not gonna be rude and ask you 56 but you look great for 56. i always uh, wonder i think about my old bands and some of the drama that i've had and i've clearly never been the level you are but some of the fights and some of the nonsense that went on i'm wondering now at 56 do you look back and say i could have probably treated this a little differently or handled this differently and maybe the band would have been continuing on maybe Janie wouldn't have left you know was some of what happened just going to happen it had to happen or do you think it was just maybe a little bit related to your youth and you know you haven't sort of had to handle that kind of situation before so it's got to be nudie and got to be very stressful when the band starts to kind of come apart <clears throat> i think it's from from my perspective it's more of a personal thing it's it has really nothing to do with the other four members in the band Look, when you're in a band, it's like being, if you, you've been in a band, you know, you know, and it's like, it's like, it's almost like being married three or four or five times, you know, it's it, it, at the same time, you know, and it's hard to manage every relationship. Like my relationship with Eric's different than my relationship with Jerry, my relationship with Robert's different. It's all different, you know, and Robert's relationship with Steven's different. And it's just, it's, there's, there's five guys in, in, you know what 25 relationships if you know if you do the math right and it's just amazing that you can all get in a room and make a record and let try to let the egos go and then once the record's done if you were you know good enough at managing your relationships you're still in a band together and you can tour then you go on the road and then that's when more ins ins insanity starts because then you got people in their habits and you know not everybody folds their socks the same way man <laughs> you know, or packs their bag the same way. Everybody's different, you know, and you, you have to respect each dude and their space. And sometimes when you're on, on the road for 10 months, you know, traveling in a tour bus with those dudes, you want to beat the shit out of each other. I gotta be honest. You don't have those moments as much as you have the moments where you want to hug and, and celebrate some really killer accomplishments together. You know, it's just like, I don't know if you guys got brothers, you know, or sisters, but it's the same thing. I mean, especially as you get older, you love them to death because you, they're part of your life. And then there's some shit that bugs, bugs you, you know, drives you nuts, you know, but keep it in perspective and try to keep the relationship there. I don't think when I left the band, I didn't leave the band because of anybody in the band. I left the band just for self-preservation, to be honest with you. I was partying hard, probably one of the hardest in the band. And just didn't want to keep doing it and had to had to had to find my way you know oh wow yeah i mean it happens and and then i went out and as i call it you know wallowed in my own vomit for a, for a year or something then i started getting my own life back together the way i wanted it and not until i was pretty steady did i you know did i even think about playing again you know there was a lot, a lot went on fast, you know, two double platinum records, world tours, and nobody was saying you can't do anything that you want to do, you know? I think it's amazing that you were able to see through all that and say, I need to take a break and step out of this because you weren't sure it would ever be there for you if you wanted to go back. It got pretty dark. I'll just put it that way. I mean, we don't have to get that far into it, but it got dark. And I think it, I think the people that have the peaks, and the valleys. I mean, once you have a few peaks and a few valleys, you learn how to circumvent, you know, the big the big fall. You kind of round that off a little bit, so it's more like a roller coaster and more fun, if that's a good analogy or not. Instead of just jumping off a cliff from the highest high to the lowest low, it can be very emotionally hard to handle. And um, just talking on a personal level, you know, it takes it takes a lot. But once you do it once or twice. You know, you learn how to navigate that pretty well, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I think about some of the, the crowds that you have played in front of. I don't know how you can step on stage and do that every day. I mean, that's just, that would terrify the hell out of me. But I've heard other musicians say, yeah, you know, it starts to feel like a job. You start to, you know, it, it just, it's not the same as it goes on. Was that maybe the same case with you? Did you ever get nervous going on stage? Did you ever say... A little tired of this i wish i didn't have to be out here today i wish i was doing something else or was it always the way you looked happy fun exciting 
Did they, there was there was one time. This is a good story where I was literally so hungover, still hammer. I don't even remember, but I was. We used to have this stage during the Cherry Pie tour, where there were dressing rooms under it. Um, it looked like a big W. It was the headlining stage, and Janie and I shared a, a dressing room, and Jerry and Eric shared a dressing room, and Stephen just kind of wandered back. And I was literally on the floor in my dressing room. The lights went out. The, the intro was rolling, and I was on, I was laying down. I was I was like ready to take a nap. And I literally, my tech grabbed me, pulled me up, put a beer in my hand. I pounded it, and I went out and just do what you got to do, you know. And and so there weren't a lot of those, but there were a few of those, you know. That was back then in our twenties where we were just crazy and partying and. You sleep all day, and then you get up, and you just you just do do the best you can. But nowadays, we're taking it a lot more seriously because you're older, and you know you can't beat yourself up like that. So it's a different situation now than it was then, um, and it's it's actually more fun now. So I don't really get nervous. I, I get you know that it's it's almost the same feeling I would think and hope everybody gets when they're at a concert and the lights go down, and you're just like fuck yeah, I'm ready for this. That's what I feel like, you know? And if you did it enough, Bill, you'd get that too, you know? Especially, man, you're not going to screw up too bad. You've been playing the same song for 30 years, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like rocket science, you know what I mean? When you're turned up that loud, I always wonder, like, do you get away with making mistakes? Can you be sloppy and it just still sounds good because the volume is so cranked up? Or are you really out there playing with such dexterity and and carefulness to be able to hit every note that you play because you, you're a fast player. You, pl you, you just do what you do. I think there's a lot of muscle memory in there, to be honest with you. I mean, I haven't – this is going to be a shocker. I haven't picked a guitar up for the most part since our last gig in February. So March, April, May, June, July, five months. I haven't really picked up a guitar. I'm, I'm actually going to GMP this week. Dan Lawrence over there that owns GMP Guitars – has two guitars. One of them's ready. I'm going to pick up the other one's almost ready, but I'm going to kind of use that new guitar to, to dive back into playing and just get my metronome out and, and start working hard again. You know, hopefully we'll have some gigs when it's safe to play here in the next few months. If it is, if not, we'll do it next year. Everything's kind of moved from this year to next year so far, um, all the way through August. Mm. Um, so it's 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 not it's 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 more muscle memory than anything and then it just matters how much you practice you know the more you play the better you play that's no brainer sure when you quit and and I think this is public knowledge you went in house you started doing uh, an IT job and I got to think you know I've been in server rooms and they're pretty boring you know places you know, there's nobody else in there but you sometimes what's that like to make that sudden switch to you know, I don't have this big stage anymore, and I'm kind of in this private little job. It was weird when I was in class before I got a gig, and I was just going through the schooling because I, I went through the Microsoft Systems, um, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer, and um, it was MCSE with uh, NT technology back way back when, and um, I took like over fifty desktop application classes, and then I got into the MCSE, MCSE coursework, and I, I actually tested out, and I got Microsoft Certified Professional plus Internet. So I took an NT rollout test. I took a TCP IP test, and I certified and all that stuff. And then I worked for a database company for about eight years. So it, when, you're in the, when you're in the classroom and you're sitting there with a bunch of fellow IT geeks, and I use that warmly because I'm an IT geek, you know, you're just sitting there kind of going, what the hell am I doing here? So, yeah, it's a bizarre feeling, you know, but when you get into business and you start learning about it and you see what the other people do um, to help really the world communicate and business work and all of the above, it's uh, pretty amazing. So I have a lot, a lot of respect for uh, IT professionals um, that keep businesses working, that keep everybody during this time of uh, pandemic working remotely and being able to communicate. It's insane. Uh, Technology is amazing. And uh, I've never shied away from it. I got an engineering degree before I was in Warrant. And, and I'll always, education is key for me. I mean, it just, 
it helped me turn a corner, but it wasn't with, with a little oddity in there. So that yeah, felt a little strange. Yeah. What, what prompted you to sort of return to warrant then? Uh, it was just timing. You know, I'd been out for eight years. Um, I kept in touch with Jerry and Eric, more, more Eric than Jerry. And Eric emailed me and said, hey, man, call me. And I was like, oh, my God. It wasn't like, hey, bro, want to jam? He's just like, call me. And I'm like, oh, no, somebody died. You know, that's the, it was just like one of those emails where you're like, this, this isn't going to be good. And I called him, and he just said that Lane, they'd gotten in an argument with Janie, and they wanted to see if I wanted to jam. And I said, and I hadn't played Warrant stuff in eight years. And I said, sure. And I went and uh, asked him what songs, because I wanted to brush up on it, and I went and, and learned, relearned stuff, you know, and went up and jammed. And, and from the get go in 2004, it was just it was fun again. You know, the main reason I left is because it wasn't fun. I was looking for, I'm like, when's my next check? You know, it was more about getting paid than it was playing. And whenever you do anything for the money, it's just heartless and it's, it's empty. It's like this soul. Um, so when I got back into it in 2004, it just felt right. And we, here we are. And you know, 16 years later, I mean, my tenure in the band this time was almost twice as long as it was the first time. Oh wow! When uh, when he started playing again, so I just found this out. I didn't know about this. So there was a point where Janie was back in. You guys were all doing it again, uh, but nothing really came of that, and that was really interesting to me. So what was your goal there? Were you going to try to recreate the old sort of version of the band, and it just didn't when, work out? Yeah, when I got back in the band, we were with Jamie St. James, and we did a record, Born Again, with him, and he's a great guy, and. And it was fun and we were kind of clawing back up you know we got uh, the first gig i ever did was with mike fazano on drums which is a great guy it props out to mike he plays in tiger army now believe it or not which is a totally different genre than what warren does but um and then steven came back so we had the four we had we had the this part of the fist you yeah. know and uh and then we had jamie st james over here and it was it was pretty fun and then I, you know, we did a gig in L.A. for Adam Carolla, the Danny Bonaducci divorce party. We were the house, <laughs> we were the, dude. We were the house band. It was at it was at the Key Club. It was uh, which used to be Zari's, and Adam was a fan, and and Danny was getting divorced, and he had a party. So we played in between skits, and and Lane was there. And I remember Dave Navarro came down into our dressing room in between takes, and he's like, Janie's there. Yeah, Janie's here, and we're like, who gives a shit, you know? Because Saint was still in the band. And I'd literally, he watched us from the rafters, and then uh, within a few weeks, we started having conversations about putting the reunion back together and going out on the road. And, and when we did that, you know, we had to let Jamie go, which was really difficult to do because he's a dear friend. And, uh, and then when Lane came back in, you know, the feeding frenzy happened, the managers come in, the agents come in, you know, the money goes way up. And we thought we were going to have, you know, a nice reunion run. We, we had a tour set with, uh, I think, Lynch, uh, Lynch Mob opening, us and Cinderella. And then uh, we were rehearsing for that. And it was great. And Lane was sober and doing great. And then he stopped showing up to rehearsals like a week and we're like and we couldn't get a hold of him we knew he was on a bender and fuck and then he rolled in one afternoon just just hammered beyond belief and he went right into rehab and that's literally how that tour started is that he went into rehab we went and saw him in rehab and we said dude your health's more important than this if, if there's some triggers going on being in this band or knowing there's this tour or all this responsibility coming at you, then let's not do it. And he's like, no, 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 we're going to do it. We got to do it. You know, and he was always game. And we went out and we did 11 shows on that run. And I would say about nine of them were just a train wreck because he couldn't, he couldn't keep it together. Uh, it was really, it sucked horribly. And then at the tail end, we just, we had to part ways because we didn't want to wake up one day on the road and, have the inevitable of him, you know, not getting up in a hotel room, going to the next gig, and the guy dies on the road on our watch. We didn't want that. 
And so we, we parted ways with him again. And at one of the last shows we did with him, Robert Mason from Lynch Mob and Cry of Love was there with his band, uh, aptly named Big Cock. I don't know if you guys have heard that band or not. No. They've got a great record out there called Year of the Cock. It's just it's <laughs> brilliant. Um, anyways, um, long story short, while Lane was still in the band and we were still trying to do reunion shows, but we knew it was just, you know, it's like watching a train wreck. Um, we went, we had Robert come out to California and we jammed, we jammed outside of California in a place called Ontario. Um, cause we didn't want anybody catching on and, and he nailed it. And then I think about a month later, Lane was out and Robert was in literally that quick. And it's been that way ever since. And we've done two records with Robert. And should I've done, you know, probably more gigs with Robert than I ever did with Janie in those first eight years. So, Oh, really? Was, yeah, it was unfortunate. I mean, I admit, I was, you know, in this, this pandemic where we're all staying home and clean. I'm sure your houses are cleaner than clean. Like, I've gone through my garage and organized everything, and I'm going through old pictures, and I found some pictures of club gigs and I look and lane like I'm on lane shoulders and it, it almost makes me cry because I you know you miss a guy and you're like wow you know you remember these magical times that you forgot that you had together and it makes all the hard times that you had together and especially at times where you see your friend not doing well makes those go away but uh he's sorrowly missed you know it's it's not really unfortunate yeah I I actually met Janie just in in Ohio I know he was out in Ohio for a while and met him at a supermarket. And mm -hmm. I've heard things, you know, I, I heard it was Janie had, you know, of course he had his demons, he had his alcohol problems. I also heard he was really sometimes very angry and very, you know, kind of grumpy. I got the grumpy Janie that day. So oh, sure. I always wondered if that was the, um, you know, maybe some of the reason, was he just that hard to work with because of the alcohol or was there just Janie had a strong personality, he was this type of person, you guys were that type of person that just couldn't last. That's unfortunate you met that guy because he wasn't like that normally. I'd say maybe 10%. I mean, has anybody here ever had a really bad hangover and you just don't want to talk to anybody? Yeah. You know? I mean, alcohol does horrible things to the body and the mind. It wasn't like that at all. I mean, it, for the most part, it was fun. You know, there were times where it was challenging, you know? If you're, if you're the main songwriter and you have success, you know, Maybe that can go to your head. I don't know. Really, I mean, I could have open conversations with him that were like the best of friends. And then we could have conversations where we hated each other for a minute because you're just like, it's like a bro having a brother. You know, that's the best way for me to put it is that it's a love-hate thing. and Much more love than hate. I mean, that hate's too strong, you know. I just, you just Sometimes you just don't get along or you're traveling with one another and the guy, you know, he's like borrows something from you and doesn't put it back. You just want to beat the shit out of them. You know, it's fun yeah. stuff like that, you know? Um, but, but in a working situation, it was what it was. There were some, as, as talented as he was songwriting, as good as he was as a front man and a singer, when he was at his height, he was equally not as talented at a business. And, and I'm not, saying anything that's not known by the other guys in the band. He just didn't make some good decisions where you look at a band like Bon Jovi, where John's made some really good decisions for, for his career and, and the band, you know, even when he wanted to do something on his own, he handled it differently and he, he didn't bastardize his brand, you know, and there were just some things that I think business wise that maybe if there was better management team or, um, maybe one that wasn't so subservient to what the artist wants to do. He could have been maybe managed a little better. And it might have been different for him. I don't know. You know, it's hard to tell somebody. Narcissism comes in and, you know, it depends on what level of narcissism. Every singer's got to have a level of narcissism to be good. But if it's too much, it's not good. You know what I mean? Um, look at the like, lead look, singer disease, right? The LSD, the lead singer. Yeah, you can get whatever you want to call. It. I mean, look at look at look at Guns and Roses. I mean, you know, Axel was out of control and would go on two or three hours late. Like no no respect for the fans. You know, everybody's going, wow, what the fucking? We don't know what the guy's problem is. Maybe he's secretly scared out of his fucking mind. I don't know. I don't I don't know him. And 
you know, the band's just sitting there waiting to go, and one guy's holding up the train. I mean, that happened a lot with Warren, not not the going on late, but just different business decisions he would make. And um, instead of setting down as a, as a, you know, having, you know, 10 eyes on the thing instead of just two. I mean, any business, if you've got some talented individuals in it, it's better to put a group effort into things and at least sit down and talk about them, you know, and, and, and not have as much emotion in it and try to, you know, make an unbiased, you know, unemotional decision about things business wise. And that, that wasn't, uh, didn't happen a lot in Warren's in those early days. Yeah. It happens now. I got to think when, you know, you guys have, you now have three albums under your belt. Janie is parting. You're picking up a new singer. Right, you picked up uh, Jamie St. James from Black and Blue, fantastic singer. Were you excited to kind of get on the road, get recording with him, or were you, oh man, this is going to be hard, this is going to be scary? What was your feeling there? I mean, that's a pretty big change at a pretty pivotal point in, you know, the the music scene. Yeah, I mean, that happened in two thousand and four. So I so I was there from eighty seven to about ninety five ish, and. Um, I did the first, those eight years and those first three records. And then when I left, I was gone for at least eight years. When I got back in, it was with Jamie and not Lane because the relationship between Jerry and Eric and Janie had eroded. Mm. And um, to be honest with you, I was doing it because I, I was having fun. Yeah. You know, it wasn't about the money because there wasn't a lot. I was working IT, making fine money, but then I had to, make a decision. Am I going to do this music thing again? Am I going to go down this IT path and do my 401k and probably be fine and be able to retire when I want to with plenty of money? Or am I going to leave my cushy job for like half that money and get back in this band and, and try to help build it back? And, and to be honest with you, it wasn't, there was no question and it didn't, it wasn't about money. And that's what I was trying to say earlier is that when it comes about money, you got to rethink what you're doing. If you have passion about something, you're passionate about something, you believe in it, and, and you can work hard enough at it to be good, uh, something's going to happen. Either you're going to enjoy what you do and die a happy man, maybe not, not a rich man uh, financially, or both, you know. So it was a leap of faith, but not, I wasn't afraid of anything. It was just, I was, I, again, it's what I wanted to do with my life, and it was fun again. It wasn't, it was no, nothing that wasn't fun. When you take a look at something like Wikipedia and you kind of see the arc of your, your entire career and your band's career, um, I think I know the answer just from the way you've been uh, answering some of these questions. But do you look back and do you say, that's a great story, that's, you know, I'm proud of this, uh, what I put out there, or is it not really something you think about that much? You're, it's just about fun, it's about the moment, it's about, you know, pushing on. Um, per personally for me, um, I don't look at, I don't look at it like that. I don't look at from the beginning to, to where it is now. I've got a friend that's, that's, that wants to do a documentary that's, that we may or may not do. And he's super talented. So it would be a good one. And he's like, we got to make it. So when you look at it, you, it's like the synopsis of your career. And I, and I've never thought about it that way. I'm just not that guy. I don't, I'm not the rock star guy. I'm, I'm the, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I, I'm a family guy. I've got my close friends I hang out with. I love my band. I love my brothers in my band. I love the music. I love to play it. But outside of that, that's it for me. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a, as in, incognito as it gets. You know, I don't need any fanfare. You know, so I've never really looked at it from beginning to end to think about it. And what's a trip is when I'm looking through my garage, find pictures, and I'm like, holy shit, I, I remember this, you know. And it's really cool, and I'm keeping it for my kids so that when I'm gone or maybe when I get older, I can show it to them um, if they care or not. You know, it's it's kind of like that. It's like any anything, you, you know, I'm sure you guys, when you when you have a, something you really want to do and accomplish and you work your ass off and you do it as soon as you accomplish it it's not like you put it on your mantle and fuck yeah i did that you just kind of go to the next thing right you know it's just yep. it's just it's the same for me some guys it might be different i don't know it's just for me it's super mellow yeah that's that's the answer i thought i was going to get i really like that approach yeah i mean you just to me that's just that's an artist you're just 
always creating. It's not about your legacy. It's about what you're building at the moment, what makes you happy and keeps you moving. So yep. I think it's really cool. Cool. Um, so we're going to close the interview. We've got one last question for you. Just curious, um, you know, when you look back at everything you've done, what what is the thing that makes you proud? So when you're going to tell your kids, you know, this is my entire legacy, what's the highlight of your output so far? The the biggest thing that really makes you smile? Like mu music, music wise? Yeah. Wow. Probably that at, you know, this age, you know, sans any pandemic bullshit that's going on, you know, it's not bullshit, but it is bullshit. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's kicking everybody's ass, which sucks. Um, so that qualifies as bullshit, but it's the real deal. So besides that, you know, still being able to tour 50, 60 dates a year with, with four of my best friends and actually look out at people and know that for an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes or if you're opening for somebody 45 minutes or whatever it is or if you're playing a casino and they want the people on the floor earlier maybe it's five minutes less anyways just looking out at those people and seeing smiles and knowing that because i'm a fan of music and i still go to shows knowing that for that hour and a half that there's not a care in the world with those people they might have they might be late on a car payment they might have some money problems or they got a girlfriend problem or boyfriend problem or whatever it is but just for that small amount of time in those people's lives knowing that you gave them some joy and fun and uh and just 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 drop all the bullshit and all those problems in the world that's that's what I want to remember. You know, I don't want to remember the gold, platinum, double platinum records, and you know, opening for whoever we open for, or having whoever opens for us. None of that is is a is as big of a deal as actually seeing the people have a good time. That's what we feed off of. I love it. That's great. Awesome, man. Man. Yeah. You know, it's got to be something to, to know that so many people were out there, like me. I was out there trying so hard to transcribe your solos, listening to the Dirty Rotten Filthy Stinging Rich album, listening to the Cherry Pie album. That's when I really got started playing guitar and just sitting there and learning it and trying to figure out the solos. That must be – I mean, you probably learned how to play guitar the same way, listening to Hendrix and all of those guys, you know. And now you have people that are learning guitar from you. I think that's awesome. I have a guitar teacher buddy that gave me guitar lessons, and I never stopped taking them. I mean, if I tour with somebody and they're just ripping it up, I'll go into their dressing room with my guitar and a little practice amp, and I'm like, show me that riff, dude. That's badass, you know? But I've got this one guy that worked with me when I was younger, and he lives in Chicago, so anytime I go through Chicago, he creeps out of the a gig, and he'll always come back after the gig, and he's like, you're not using your pinky enough, man. You're blowing it, you're, you know? And he just calls me out. And I'm, I'm like, fuck you, you know? Okay, I gotta practice, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I still practice. Not not lately, but I will be soon, and I, I'll get those books out and and uh, just do what I do and, and then start start working on the set again. So hopefully we'll be out when this, when this pandemic, when it's safe to be out and people can come to a show safely, we'll be doing it again, you know? We can't wait. Yeah, me neither. I'll be there. Well, anything, any last things to plug? Any kind of, I mean, warrantrocks.com, that is your website. Yep, yep. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Feel free to say hi anytime. We're pretty pretty open guys. We Once the gigs, like I said, we're closed. We're canceled through August. We're looking at September. Um, we're kind of looking at things. I, we've seen a few bands go out there and play, a few country artists go out there and play, and everybody with a laptop, a keyboard is a, is a critic. So we see a lot of artists just get pelted on for doing gigs and, and we don't want to put anybody in any amount of risk at all. So it's just, we're waiting to see when we can go out there and you'll find it all on the Facebook or the website, warrantrocks.com or anywhere. And if you see us out on the road, come up, come to a show. We're pretty open people. You know, if it's a casino, you might find us at the blackjack table the night before. So <laughs> don't be shy. We don't bite. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Joey. Thank you for doing this. I am very honored that you did this. It was wonderful oh, to meet Bill, you. Thank you for the time, and thank you for, uh, for your years of fandom, man. We appreciate it more than you know. Absolutely my pleasure.
I couldn't help it if I tried. I I love you guys. So cool. take it easy. All right. Have a good Thank week you, man. Week. All right. Bye. Thank you.